Hello everybody and welcome back to another exciting edition of Ed Puzzle Notes. We're going to continue on our journey through ecology. For those of you guys that did the last Ed Puzzle Notes, remember we learned about producers or autotrophs. Remember those are things like plants, usually things like plants, trees, bushes, algae that can make their own food inside their cells so they do not have to eat. Now usually these autotrophs, these producers, use energy from the sun. So they use sunlight in order, and then they also get CO2 and water and they convert that into a sugar. Now that is use, that's using photosynthesis. Not all of them do that. Some autotrophs or producers use what's called chemosynthesis. And it's basically the same exact thing. They're making sugars, they're making their own food, but they're not going to use the sun like they do in photosynthesis. These organisms, usually bacteria, they use the energy from chemicals, chemical energy, in order to make their food molecules, the sugar. So it's basically the same thing, just chemosynthesis uses the energy from chemicals, or photosynthesis, the organisms use energy from the sun. All right, so before we move any further, we're gonna have a quick little review. Those of you that did the first Ed Puzzle, these words will seem familiar. For those of you that did not, it's time to, to stop falling behind. Let's get caught up today. All right, so biotic factors. Those are the living components or living factors in an ecosystem which affect other living things. For example, for a mouse, living in Tulare, what are some living things that would affect him? Well, that mouse would be affected by cats, by whatever they eat, like the grass, grains. So they'll be affected by owls, because owls can eat the mice. So cats, grains, owls, these are all biotic factors that will affect a mouse. Now what are some the abiotic factors, the non-living things that will affect the mouse? Well, what are some non-living things? Definitely water. Water is non-living, it's, it's not living. But without water, the mouse would not be living. Also temperature also affects the mouse. So abiotic factors are the non-living parts of an ecosystem which affect the living things. Not just mice, they affect everything. Remember a population, that's the total number of one species in an area. So the population of Tulare is 60,000, but it's 60,000 people. That is not including the dogs, the cats, the birds. It is only people, and that's what makes it a population. It's the total number of one species in an area. Now remember a community that is much larger, because now it's not just one species, it's everything living. So it's everything living. Everything living in an area makes up a community. Or you can just say, it's all the biotic factors. All the biotic factors in an area make up the community. Now remember, an ecosystem is the community, but it also involves or includes the non-living environment. So it's the com all the community and the non-living environments. So now we're, we're taking in also the abiotic factors, and that's what's going to make up our, our ecosystem. It's all the living things and their non-living environment. Things like the soil, the water, sunlight, etc. Next one was a biome. The biome is a very large geographical area that has similar climate, Therefore, similar types of plants and animals live there. For example, you have a desert biome, which a lot of California is a desert biome. So you're not going to see polar bears or sharks or monkeys in a desert, but you will see cacti, a cactus. You'll see snakes like rattlesnakes. You'll see jackrabbits. You'll see coyotes. Those are all included in the desert biome. There's all types of different biomes. Marine biome, that's like the ocean, the tropical rainforest, etc. And the last one, the biggest, is the biosphere. That is basically all life on Earth. All life 
on Earth makes up the biosphere. And as we said on the last slide, remember a producer or autotroph, that is an organism that can make its own food inside of its cells, usually talking about things like plants, like grass, little bushes, or trees. So those are producers slash autotrophs. All right, now the opposite of autotrophs or producers are things like us. We are consumers or otherwise called heterotrophs. These are things that have to eat. They must eat something else in order to get their energy. Everything, everybody knows lions and tigers, they have to eat in order to get their energy. Same thing with this black widow spider. It's got to catch insects in its web to get its energy. Now these mushrooms, they kind of look like plants, but they're not. They do not, they do not make their own food. They're decomposers. So they grow in areas where wood or other things are rotting and they actually kind of eat that decaying matter. And this is a single-celled organism, a paramecium. And yes, it cruises around and just looks for little things in the water to eat. And it actually takes them in and eats them and you can actually see this under the microscope. So these are all heterotrophs because they have to eat in order to get their energy. Okay, so now some different classes of consumers or heterotrophs. The first one's called an herbivore. Herbivore. These type of organisms only eat producers, and we're usually talking about plants. So things that only eat plants, things that only eat producers, like deer, like cows. They will not eat meat, even if you tried to feed it to them, they won't eat it. Because deer and cows, they only eat plants, they only eat producers, they're herbivores. Now, the opposite of that are things like lions, wolves. They're called carnivores because they only eat other animals. They only eat other heterotrophs. For example, dolphins. Dolphins don't eat plants. They eat fish. Lions, they eat other animals. Frogs eat insects. They do not eat plants. So carnivores are organisms which only eat other animals. Then you have things like us and bears and mice. We're omnivores because we eat both plants and animals, or both producers slash autotrophs and other heterotrophs. So us, humans, bears, mice, we're omnivores because we eat both plants and other animals. And the last little class of heterotrophs or consumers are these things called decomposers. These are little tiny guys that break down waste or dead tissue. So bacteria, big time decomposer. Fungi like mushrooms, those are decomposers because they break down things that died. In case you didn't know, when things die, why, why does it start stinking? Well, because they're decomposing. The bacteria is actually converting that living, that, that dead tissue, and it's turning it into a gas like CO2, which then goes back up into the air. Well, that CO2 from whatever died that goes into the air, that CO2 can now be taken in by plants, and that CO2, that carbon that was once in that dead whatever, the dead mouse or, or rabbit or whatever, can now be used again by the plant. And now if something eats that plant, it'll also take in that carbon that was once in whatever died. So decomposers allow these nutrients to be recycled, to be used over and over and over again because de decomposers return that carbon, oxygen, hydrogen back into the biosphere so it can be used again. Okay, a couple more little key terms here. The first one's called a habitat. And all you need to know is, think of a habitat kind of like the home of an organism. Where can you find it? So, if you wanted to find a gopher, its natural habitat, it likes grass. It likes grasslands. It also likes to bury itself underneath the ground in a hole. That is the natural habitat of a gopher. Now, if you're looking for a shark, that would not be the habitat for a shark. For a shark, you're going to have to go into the ocean. 
coastal waters. Some sh sharks like warm water, some like cold. So you got to know the, where that organism will be found and where it, where it can be found. That's called its habitat or its home. The second term is called its niche. And its niche is a little different. The niche is what role or what job does an organism play in its community? So, for example, the shark. What does a shark do to other organisms in the, in the community? Well, it likes to eat fish. It is a carnivore. Fish go into the shark, so that's part of its niche. Sharks eat fish. Sharks eat seals. Sharks make baby sharks. So forth. So basically everything that animal does, that is part of its niche. Like some animals are active during the day. That's called being diurnal. That would be part of its niche. Some are only come out at night or nocturnal. That would be part of its niche. Some, like bears, hibernate in the wintertime, which basically means they sleep for the entire winter. That would also be part of an organism's niche. So everything an organism does in its community makes up its niche. Its habitat is just where it can be found. In the ocean, in a river, in a forest, in a jungle, whatever. All right, so now you have the San Joaquin Valley kit fox. I personally never have seen one, even though it, it comes from right here in the San Joaquin Valley where we live, but I have never seen one because they're pretty rare now. Well, it's habitat. That means it's home. Where can it be found? Dry grasslands, desert scrub areas at lower elevations, and specifically in the San Joaquin Valley. Now, if you went to Bakersfield, they still do have some of these around, and there are still around some around here in the foothills, but this is where they're found. They're found in the San Joaquin Valley. That is their natural habitat or their home. Now, what is, what is the niche? What is the niche of a San Joaquin Valley kit fox? Well, one, time, one reason you never see them is because they're nocturnal. They're out at night. They're sleeping during the day. They're carnivores, which mean they eat other animals. They eat other heterotrophs. Specifically, they like to eat rodents like mice. They eat lizards. They'll eat some birds that nest on the ground. Every now and then, they will be preyed upon or eaten themselves by large raptors, which is birds, or larger coyotes. They're active year-round, and their mating season is early to mid-spring. So all of these things right here make up the niche of the San Joaquin Valley kit fox, because this is all the stuff that it does inside of its community. All right, now here's a little ecosystem. Looks like African ecosystem. Identify as many biotic and abiotic factors that you can see, and there are tons. So we'll go biotic factors, so like this bird, it's living, it's biotic. Uh, the tree, the elephant, the giraffe, these gazelles, the zebra, the grass, everything that's living, that, those are all the biotic factors. Now the abiotic factors that I can see, water right here, very, very important because this uh, gazelle right there is drinking the water. Water is an abiotic factor. Sunlight, temperature, abiotic factor. The soil, is it good soil, bad soil? That's an abiotic factor that affects all the living things in that community. Now, here's a little question. What is the niche of the grass? What is the niche? Remember, that just means what does the grass do in its community? Well, what's it good for? And this grass out here, well, obviously, it gets eaten by these herbivores, like the wildebeest, or the zebras, or the gazelles. So that's the niche of the grass. It gets eaten by herbivores. It is a producer. It is the very bottom of the, of the food chain. Now, I don't really see a vulture in here. I'm guessing maybe that's it. Kind of hard to tell. But what's the niche of a vulture? Well, a vulture eats things that are dead. It's a scavenger. So it's, its job, its role that it plays in the community is it helps to clean up dead organisms. So things that are dead, you know, the vulture comes in and, and eats those dead things, picks the meat away, and helps get rid of the, the dead uh, animals. All right, so recycling in the biosphere. Recycling. Now there's two types of systems. There's open systems and there's closed systems. 
Now all that means is, first let's start with the open system. Energy on Earth is an open system. Why? Because every single day of the year, the, the Earth gets more energy from the sun every single day. Plants take that energy from the sun to make sugars. And then things eat those plants to get that energy. And then things eat those animals to get their energy. So without continuous sunlight, all the plants on Earth would die. Therefore, the things that eat those plants, they'll also die. And the things that eat the guys that eat the plants are also going to die. So the Earth is reliant. It needs a continuous source of energy in order to keep life on Earth going. Now, nutrient cycles, on the other hand, are closed systems. And when I'm talking about nutrient cycles, I'm talking about things like water, carbon, and nitrogen. So all that means is we got all the water on earth we'll ever have. We're, we cannot make more water. We cannot make more carbon. We cannot make more nitrogen. We have all that we're ever going to have on this earth. So in order for life to not stop, we got to recycle it. We got to use these nutrients over and over and over again. We got to reuse water. Just because you drink water, it doesn't go away forever. That water will always goes through the, the water cycle and it keeps coming around. We keep reusing it. We're drinking the same water today that dinosaurs drank 65 million years ago. So in a closed system like nutrients, no new materials are being added to the biosphere. We have all that we're ever going to have. We're in open systems. New energy, new sunlight comes from the sun every single day. All right, two more slides and that's it. We're going to quickly go over the water cycle. The water cycle, how water is actually recycled through the biosphere, through the earth. And here are the key terms. I'm going to show you a picture on the next one, but get all these terms down in your notes. And then I'll explain them in a picture on the next slide. But get, them all, get all those in your notes. All right, so here we go. Here's where... Most of the water on Earth is found. It's found in the oceans. It doesn't stay there forever. You know, the oceans will always be there, but the water is constantly moving around on Earth. And the first step is when water goes from a liquid and escapes back into the air and becomes a gas. We see it all the time. If it rains, the puddles in Tulare don't stay there forever because water eventually evaporates. So evaporation is the process of liquid water turning into a gas and going into the atmosphere or the sky. Well, as water continues, as water vapor continues to rise, it gets colder and colder and colder as you move up. That's why there's snow up here on the top of the mountains. Well, if it gets cold enough, that water vapor, the gas, can turn back into a liquid. And that is called condensation. Condensation, when gas, water vapor, turns into a cloud, which is when it turns back into liquid water. Now, every now and then, I'm sure you've seen this, sometimes water falls from the sky. Snow, rain, sleet, hail. Anytime water falls from the sky, whether it's a solid like snow or liquid like rain, that is called precipitation. Precipitation. And, so now once water gets onto the ground, sometimes it seeps below the ground to form groundwater. There's actually like, kind of like big lakes underneath the ground, groundwater. Another word for seepage is percolation. Percolation. All right, so that's the process. Percolation is the process of water going underneath the ground to form groundwater. That groundwater can then be taken up by plants. And the last little thing here is, this is another way that water goes back into the, into the air, the atmosphere. It's called transpiration. Transpiration. And what that is, that is water escaping through the leaves of trees or plants and going back into the atmosphere. Most of the water that plants need 
it just gets released right back into the atmosphere. They pump it up to their leaves and then it escapes and goes back into the air. So transpiration is water escaping through plants and going back into the atmosphere or back into the air. All right, thank you very much for listening. Talk to you next time.